you can survive without food for three, maybe four weeks. You can survive without water for seven um, or maybe 10 days. It doesn't get more basic when we're talking about basic needs. Food and water are really leading there. My name is Ella Made. I'm a founding partner at a venture fund based in San Francisco called 50 Years. And today I'm going to tell you about the, all the problems uh, with the current food and water systems we have and how Winston Churchill can help us solve them. Let's start with water. We use fresh water for drinking, sanitation, agriculture. The core problem is that just there isn't enough of it. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, millions of people lack a basic drinking water service. And in low and middle income countries, over a third of healthcare facilities do not have uh, clean water and soap for hand washing. So globally, over 2 billion people use drinking water that's contaminated with feces. And on top of being just disgusting, it helps spread uh, diseases such as diarrhea and polio, which then in result kill hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And it's, just, and it's not just in the developing countries. In the United States, alarming uh, levels of bacteria and viruses and even poisonous lead are found in water on a regular basis. And recently, a study came out showing that almost all of U.S. tap water is contaminated with microplastics. And yes, we don't fully yet know what microplastics do to us, but we know they stay in our body. So we're about to find out. So the state of the art of technology in water handling um, is pretty lame. We ha have fresh water from open water sources, or we dig it from the ground using pipes. And then we use other pipes and trucks and ships to move that water around. So water might be che cheap, but moving it around is very expensive. And because we use fresh water um, on such a massive scale, we're depleting the sor current sources we have faster than we can replenish them. In fact, just a few years from now, half of the world's population will be, li will be living in water-stressed areas. Let's stop here and move on to food. The good news in food is that there seems to be enough of it. The bad news is that it's not distributed very well, and it's killing us and it's killing the planet. 10% of the world's population is still undernourished in 2017. And again, it's not just in the developing countries. Millions of Americans were food insecure, um, and were food insecure as, as well last year. And that includes 10 millions of children. And in addition to that, we actually need to start making more food to meet the demands of the growing populations. So we clearly should have a really good technology to do that, right? Well, that is a state-of-the-art technology in protein production in 2017. It literally has not changed in thousands of years. And I was not going to guide you through terrifying pictures from slaughterhouses to show you how we actually extract the protein, but looking at the math alone, can make you question if this is really the best we can do. We put 30 calories in, we get one calorie out. This is the current food system for beef. And that's in addition to land use, water use, the time needed to raise those poor animals, and all the waste that comes from animal agriculture. In fact, animal agriculture produces more greenhouse gases than all sectors of transportation combined. That's uh, ground transportation, water transportation, planes, all of it. And we were able to, on the way, create another problem, which is not just a problem, it's actually an existential threat to the humanity itself, because we're feeding animals antibiotics that end up in their bodies and in the soil. There is a new class of bacteria growing that's just resistant to common antibiotics. And that might not sound as dangerous until you think that antibiotic resistance might be uh, the largest killer um, in 2050. Why? Because we need antibiotics that work for even the simplest surgery. And when we don't have working antibiotics, uh, children, 
immunocompromised individuals and elderly can die of common cold. And this is real because we're not getting much better. Um, we're not creating more antibiotics right now. So you can ask, what the heck does Winston Churchill has to do with all of that? Well, in 1931, he wrote this amazing essay called 50 Years Hence. And in that essay, he was looking at um, all the developments that were happening in science, and he was looking at all the developments in engineering, and he was thinking about the state of the world. So he starts that essay by saying that the great mass of human beings is only dimly conscious of the pace which, at which the mankind, mankind has begun to travel. And then he talks about what's going to happen. And he makes the brave thesis that by observing science, we can predict and also design the world. And applying it to food, he said 86 years ago, and I'll read it in Hall, we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or a wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. So in 86 years ago, he essentially predicted cellular agriculture, what's only um, becoming possible now. And he doesn't start there. In that essay, written, uh, I'm reminding you, in the early 30s, he was talking about using bacteria and yeast as platforms for making proteins and other materials. He talks about harvesting solar, wind, and even nuclear energy. He talks about advanced nanoengineering and putting together atoms directly to make novel types of material. He talks about uh, climate control and geoengineering. He predicts wireless communication, genetic modification, end of disease. It's pretty mind-boggling how just looking at where this, what was the state of science in the 1930s and reasoning from there, he was able to predict those things. And a great part about that essay is at the end, he talks about the immense powers that scientists and us technologists have. And he talks about that with the great power comes great responsibility. And we should all be taking a principled approach to our work. And in fact, we named our, we named our firm after that essay. So since 2015, we've been, we've been investing in brave technological solutions to the world's biggest problems. And in the last 32 years, in the last two and a half years, we, inv uh, we invested in 32 companies, including the now famous Memphis Meats, which is growing real, clean meat outside of animals, a company building novel proteins with plants, and a company using uh, computer vision, sensors, and machine learning to reinvent the way we farm. So the less, in the last almost three years, we've learned some lessons from Winston and from the entrepreneurs we're able to back. First, yes, look at the past, but remember you're in the business of building the future. So apply scientific rigor and the principles engineering the problem solving, and specifically to, to solving the biggest problems in the world. And we see that the best entrepreneurs start with first principles, and they don't settle for small improvements for the 5 10% improvement. They, the best entrepreneurs imagine a world, what the world could be, and they find a way to, take, to work backwards from there. Finally, take responsibility um, for the world around you. And if you're working on something impactful, um, remember about all the impacts it can have. So let's get back to food and water. Some interesting technologies in water we can talk about industrial desalination, different types of filters, from, um, from nanofilters to UV and microbi microbiological solutions for purification. We can even think if chemical synthesis of water would, be, um, would it be a viable solution at large scale. But I want to uh, tell you about um, a new type of porous crystals called metal organic frameworks. And they're really excited because with them, we can be taking water from air. So there's a mind-boggling hundreds of millions of billions of liters of water uh, in the air in the form of vapor. And that water gets replenished daily, and it's just there. So I think the type of um, revolution that's been happening for fossil fuels when we're taking stuff from the ground and moving it around in pipes and ships and trucks um, 
to solar, where we just harvest the energy that's there, is going to happen for water. A, um, a small cube of uh, metal organic crystal uh, of the size of a, um, of a, um, of a, of a sugar cube um, has an internal surface area of a football field. So those materials can absorb crazy amounts of water, and there's no reason to, uh, to doubt that in a few years this is how we will be uh, getting our water, even in the driest places on Earth. Let's get back to food. There are multiple ways in which we can fix the existing food systems, and some of them are just getting ready for scale, and I think the food system is about to see a massive transformation. You're going to hear about different types of plant proteins that some of them we haven't used before, and for some of them we're going to use new some of them we're going to find new applications for. We can harvest uh, protein from insects for algae and mycelium, which I'm personally very excited about. We can uh, get novel ingredients and, and, uh, and protein to eat from yeast fermentation, and we can feed methane to bacteria um, to make stuff for us. But I want to draw your attention again to cellular agriculture, to this new idea of instead of using animals as bioreactors to make food, using their cells directly. In that way, you can farm the cells outside of animals in a matter of weeks, not days, and reduce the land and water and uh, energy consumptions by uh, you know, up to 99%. So here, I want to finish by quoting Winston. We know enough to be sure that scientific achievements of the next 50 years will be far greater, more rapid, and more surprising than those we have already experienced. And to that, we at 50 years channel our inner Winston, and we say, bring it on. Thank you.